Hello everyone, it's Timothy here with Jank Diver Gaming, and today we're going to do a rundown of the two color archetypes in the Jank Diver Peasant Cube. This is intended as a sort of intro video for players who are first time drafters of our cube, and should serve as a handy guide for new players to decide what to prioritize during one of these drafts. As always, subscribe to the channel for more content like this, and feel free to comment with suggestions of cube related videos you'd like to see in the future. Also, if you're not currently part of our community, we'll have links to the Discord server below, so come join us and try out the cube for yourself. So before we get into specific archetypes, let's just give a brief overview of some of the design philosophies that went into making this cube. Notably, we're limited by the cards that are present on Arena, which means some archetypes will be better defined than others simply based on the cards that are available to us at the time. Some of the broader archetypes might change over time, but for the most part, our cube is centered around the typical archetypes you tend to see in most limited sets. For example, red-black is generally a sacrifice deck, and blue-red is a spells matters deck. When designing the cube, Chris and I intended for each color pair to splinter into two decks if possible to give you more variety in how you can draft each color pair. Obviously, this will be more feasible in some color combinations. Some decks achieve this goal quite fine, while other color pairs really only have one overarching strategy. Also note that there are some monocolor decks floating around, and some micro archetypes that I might talk about in a future video, but for now, we're going to stick to the 10 main color pairs. We're going to work our way down the line from highest win percentage to lowest win percentage with Demir holding the top spot as our most winning color pair. Demir is one of the lesser defined archetypes and can reasonably be described as the primary control deck of the cube. It's hard to put your finger on exactly one thing that Blue Black wants to be doing game in game out, but it usually boils down to one in a mix of removal, counter spells, and a small number of good late game finishers. Ultimately, you want to be able to deal with anything that comes your way, stick a threat, and ride that threat to victory. One of the advantages with Demir is that you can be very picky about your win con. Your plan can be sticking a Night Veil Predator and riding that to victory while you keep the board stable, or you might just want to drop Ominous Seas early on and stall the game out until your 8-8s finish the job. Either way, your plan usually revolves around a small subset of cards that can actually win the game, and the rest of your deck is the typical control game plan. The combination of counter spells, discard effects, and efficient removal means that you have answers to just about anything your opponent can play. As we mentioned just a little while ago, we intend for color pairs to diverge into multiple decks, and while blue-black is typically best played as a control deck, there's a small reanimator identity mixed into the color combination. We've got a number of mid-range reanimation effects throughout the cube, and blue-black has plenty of great targets worth reanimating. You can go the value route by bringing back a Denrova Horror or Vampire Sovereign, or you can go big with something like Waker of Waves, which puts itself in the graveyard, making it a creature tailor-made for reanimator. Obsessive Stitcher is another self-contained engine that helps dump value creatures in the graveyard and provides an additional reanimation effect staple to a body. The reanimation subtheme isn't something you always go for when you're in Demir, but it's something to be on the lookout for if you're seeing the cards. Orzov's up next as our second best performing deck, and you'll note here that our two archetypes with the highest win percentage both include black. Interestingly, Orzov is one of the color pairs where there are two very distinct styles of deck within the same subset of cards. The more prolific strategy is black-white life gain, which revolves mostly around the M21 package of cards that all cared about gaining 3 life in a single turn. Those cards are Griffin Airy, Indulgent Patrician, and Silver Smoke Ghoul, which form the cornerstone of the life gain deck, and influence a lot of the choices we make as far as what life gain cards make it into the cube. You'll see plenty of one-shot effects that gain 3 or more life to ensure that these cards tick, with some other payoffs built in. The life gain deck is also just as happy to have cards like a Johnny's Pride Mate and Attended Healer, which key off of incremental life gain and pay you off for pretty much anything that can increase your life total. Orzov splits into a very different direction with an aristocrat style deck that's focused more on small creatures and sacrifice effects to bleed the opponent out over time. This is the quote unquote death by a thousand cuts deck, which wants to combine blood artist style creatures and sacrifice engines to clock your opponent without ever really needing to attack. 
The name of the game here is Bodies and Sacrifice Outlets, so cards like Weapon Craft Enthusiast and Hidden Stockpile are premium pickups while creatures like Bushmeat Poacher and Lampad of Death's Vigil act as your engine pieces. This deck is also capable of gaining an inordinate amount of life, but cares less about the 3 life threshold that other Orzhov decks really need to hit. Regardless of which Orzhov deck you end up in, you get to pick up the good black removal and your life gain gives you plenty of time to get your game plan going, so it's not really a surprise that Orzhov is one of the better color combinations in the cube. Selesnia is pretty one note as far as strategy goes. It's the typical plus one plus one counter deck of the cube, and while we fiddled around with plus one counters in other color pairs, it's naturally fell into Selesnia's lap after the release of M21. There was a time shortly after our M21 update where players were dominating with this deck, and even after some of the latest iterations, Selesnia is capable of perhaps the most explosive draws in the entire cube when things come together. When you get to curve out with a couple of plus one plus one counters and a few proliferate effects, you often get so far out of the opponent's reach that they can't make a realistic comeback. An unchecked Conclave Mentor into any sweep and plus one counter effect is usually game over, and there are plenty of role players like Iridescent Horn Beetle and Tempered Veteran that give you more stay in power if the game drags on. Here's the problem though. While you have some incredibly broken draws, you're pretty easy to disrupt, and red or black decks packing a ton of removal can usually pick off your key pieces before you get out of hand. So in a lot of ways, the Selesnia counters deck is a bit of a glass cannon. If you get disrupted too heavily or your creatures get systematically removed, then your game plan falls apart. As such, when I'm drafting this deck, I look to pick up protection spells like Fight as One and Blossom and Defense pretty highly, since they can keep your key pieces alive. Green-White can alternatively be played as a straight-up go-wide token deck, but the thing is, one of the ways to get paid off for being in a go-wide deck is by playing mass board pumps, and the cube offers most of those in the form of sweep and plus one plus one counter cards like Bossery Solidarity and Pledge of Unity. Once you're in the market to pick up those cards, you usually just fall in line with the counter synergy cards. Whichever route you end up going down, Selesnia wants to be attacking and it wants to make its creatures huge, so naturally plus one plus one counters is the way to go. Boros lands exactly where you'd expect it to, serving as our resident aggro deck in the cube. There are certainly other aggro decks floating around, but Boros takes a more all-in approach looking to skimp on lands and curve out with mostly 3 drops and the occasional powerhouse card like Charging Monstrosaur. A quick look at the gold section for Boros will show you that you're focused on attacking and pumping your team, and Boros features plenty of ways to turn a board of small creatures into actual threats. There are multiple effects like Goblin Aura Flame and Bolt Hound running around which reward you for all in aggression, while the white half of the deck gives you ample ways to fill up your board with tokens and take advantage of the sweeping board pumps. Now with that being said, Boros has a pretty glaring weakness in the form of mini sweepers in the black and red sections of the cube. Flame Sweep and Cinderclasm can be managed a little bit, with some of white's more resilient beaters like Adanto Vanguard and Seasoned Hallowblade, but Black has access to Infest effects in Golden Demise and Cry of the Carnarium, which are a bit trickier to dodge. I'm not normally a fan of full-on hate drafting, but in this case, if I knew I was leaning towards an all-in Boros deck, I would likely poach these sweepers from other players when I saw them. Despite the existence of pretty good countermeasures to a fully dedicated aggro deck's existence in the environment, Boros has proven multiple times that it can punish slower decks, and clocks in as our fourth highest win percentage among two color decks in the cube. Rounding out the bottom of our top five most winning decks is Gruul, which is an odd case since it was perhaps the worst color pair for a long time, but with some recent additions became a pretty reasonable contender in the meta. Gruul fits what players like to call the stompy deck of the format a more mid-range oriented version of an aggro deck looking to play fatties and push through for larger chunks of damage. You rely very heavily on fight effects to push your way through, and often implement a ramp strategy to get ahead of the curve. We could easily parse things out by saying that there's a Gruul beatdown deck and a Gruul ramp deck, but they often blend into one since the version of Gruul looking to beat down with 4-4s four on turn 3 is still going to draft mana dorks highly. There's also a small sub-theme of Four Powers Matters floating around, with cards like Nessun Hornbeetle and Garrick's Uprising rewarding you for specifically sized creatures, 
but 4 plus power creatures are plentiful and it's fairly easy to pick up a handful of them when necessary. Gruul is actually one of those archetypes that lives or dies by some of its key cards. Land War Elves is irreplaceable, as it's our only 1 mana accelerant that we have below rare on Arena, and leads to your most unbeatable draws. Garrick's Uprising is a card advantage machine for Gruul decks, and the trample it grants to all of your creatures is usually extremely relevant. Note that Gruul has a few obvious weaknesses as well, specifically in the Counterspell and Death Touch department. Blue decks are happy to let your mana dorks resolve and focus on countering your ramp targets, so try to pick up Destiny Spinner or Rhythm of the Wild for those matchups. Also, Black has access to a number of Death Touchers that can brick wall a large green creature, so finding ways around them can help out in a green versus black matchup, which is traditionally a tough matchup for green decks. Note that much of what Gruul cares about is green, so the red half of the archetype mostly provides efficient removal on top end beaters. In a lot of ways, it's a nearly mono green deck that often splashes the best red cards you happen to pick up. I'm actually surprised to see Azorius as high as it is on the list of best performing decks, mostly because it's had a bit of an identity crisis through the cube's iterations, and I personally tanked a number of drafts playing bad blue-white decks early on. Nonetheless, Azorius does what it always does. That is to say, it's a flyers deck looking to jam basically any creature with the word flying on it and ways to turn those flyers into persistent forms of card advantage. Your engine pieces are the two curiosity effects and reconnaissance mission, which allow you to turn your evasive creatures into extra answers and threats. You're basically looking to fly over the top of your opponent while burying them in card advantage. You can also go the route of just trying to make your flyers as big as possible with anthem effects, but these two approaches are not mutually exclusive and the flyers deck will often combine whatever set pieces it gets its hands on to form a plan. It's a bit of a fragile deck since it often takes risks by throwing auras on its creatures, so if you're going down this route be sure to protect your creatures with some sort of cheap interaction. Note that for a long while, Blue-White had a mini artifact and enchantment sub-theme floating around that centered on the card All That Glitters as the primary win con. There are still plenty of enchantments running around to make the card worth running, it's just something we cut back on to intentionally bolster the power of the Flyers deck, which had not been performing well. Also bear in mind that Blue-White often functions as a control deck in most cubes, but if you take a look at the white cards we have access to on Arena, you'll notice that white doesn't have a well-supported set of control cards. You don't get sweepers at lower rarities in white, so you lose a lot of what Blue-White typically does as a color pair, and that means we focus more heavily on the Flyers theme than a potential Azorius control variant. Rakdos is a fan favorite of some of our drafters, and while it's in the bottom half of best performing decks, it's far from weak. Your game plan is similar to that of Orzhov Aristocrats decks, combining aggressive creatures with sacrifice shenanigans to kill the opponent quickly. Rakdos is interesting though in that it often plays out as more of a combo aggro deck that looks to attack your opponent down to a lower life total and finish them off with burn or incidental damage. Your Fireblade Artist's Lamp Pads and Weaponize the Monsters all do a great job of finishing an opponent off after they've stabilized. In a lot of ways, Rakdos wants to be fast and aggressive like Boros, but once a player stabilizes against Boros, it's tough for that deck to push through. Rakdos often shifts to a backup plan of just burning the opponent out in this situation, ignoring the opponent's board for the most part. Now, Boros has a higher win rate than Rakdos, so take from that what you will, but in my opinion, Rakdos is perhaps the scariest deck to play against in terms of how many ways they can still beat you after you've managed to stabilize against them. Theoretically, there's a Mardu deck that looks to combine all of the best aristocrat cards from Orzhov and Rakdos into one deck, but the mana fixin's a bit dubious in this color combination, so you often end up sticking to one or the other. You will likely be fighting other players for the pingin effects like Bastion of Remembrance and Blood Artist, so take those highly and look for recursive creatures and ways to burn the opponent out. Pro tip, Reassembling Skeleton is an absolute game changer for this deck, as it's the only repeatable recurring body that we have access to, and we found that picking up Reassembling Skeleton in your Rakdos decks is a complete game changer in how some games play out. 
Next up is Golgari, which is a bit of an odd child in that it's not super focused on a single particular strategy, but rather plays out as more of a value deck with minute strategies sprinkled in. There's an aristocrat style token deck with Slimefa and Moldervine Reclamation. There's a full on reanimator deck looking to Bond of Revival a Titanoth Rex. And there's a mid range deck looking to just outvalue the opponent with good removal and decent late game threats. Some of the themes don't quite gel, so that might have something to do with Golgari ranking as low as it does, but if you lean heavily on the recursive elements and graveyard interactions of the color pair, you'll usually walk away with a decent deck. It's worth noting that Green Black is usually happy to grab a few mana dorks but doesn't need to overload on them, and you often end up splashing another color, whether it be white for the flashback cost of unburial rights or blue to cast a Dinrova Horror. Your focus is less on ramping and more on outvaluing the opponent, so you're looking for natural two-for-ones. Cards like Elspeth's Nightmare and The Eldest Reborn package a number of small effects into one, so they tend to be high picks, but you'll see tons of value options floating around the black-green section, whether it's an Acolyte of Affliction, an Escape Creature, or just a Raise Dead effect like Wander and Death to recur to smaller creatures. Obviously, Ravenous Chupacabra is the best card you have access to, and being able to play the same Chupacabra multiple times can be devastating. If you feel yourself going down the token route instead, try to grab creatures like Imperious Perfect and Slimefoot, which function as repeatable token generators, and use cards like Malefic Scythe and Village Rites to profit off of these tokens. You're less focused on pumping all of your tokens for a big attack like you would be in Selesnya or Boros, and more focused on turning your tokens into extra cards and life. I'm actually a little disappointed to see Is It performing as low down the list as it does. As a base Spells Matters archetype, it's exceptionally well supported with plenty of Spells Matters payoffs and naturally plenty of instants and sorceries to fill out the deck. It actually plays around in two very distinct playstyles with many overlapping cards, and if I had to attribute anything to Is It's lower win percentage, it would be players pushing cards into one Is It deck when those cards are at their best in an entirely different style of Is It deck. To clarify, Is It splits into two categories. On one hand, you've got a half tempo, half aggro deck that wants to use Sprite Dragon, Riddle Form, and other hard hitters to turn your spells into actual damage. That's not to say you wouldn't play cards like Sprite Dragon in every Is It deck, but rather, if you're trying to kill your opponent quickly, you should place more of an emphasis on raw power. Cards like Crackling Drake and Tauren's Invocation excel here, as they put a ton of pressure on the opponent for a reasonable cost. Also, you have access to all of the burn spells from Red, so you often try to take huge chunks out of the opponent's life total and finish up with some lightning strikes. The other style of Is It deck is more of a control variant. You'll still play all of the cards we've mentioned thus far, but your primary focus should be on getting extra value out of your actual instants and sorceries. You want Electrostatic Field and Gutter Snipe to be your heavy lifters in terms of dealing damage, and Murmuring Mystic tends to be your trump card. You're less focused on aggression and killing the opponent quickly, and more focused on draw spells and counter spells, prolonging the game and killing through incremental advantage. Whereas the first style of Is It deck wins through attacking hard and fast, the second version doesn't even need to attack to win most of the time, and wins primarily through burn spells and incremental damage. It's important to identify which deck you're in when drafting Is It, and while there's plenty of overlap in the cards available to the color pair, you should optimize for either, either full on aggression or full on control instead of trying to mix and match the two. While I wouldn't quite call it rock bottom, something's gotta fall into last place, and in the case of the Peasant Cube, that honor falls to Simic. Ironically, our best performing deck in the Unrestricted Cube is our worst performing deck in the Peasant Cube. And for what it's worth, Simic has had some unnecessarily powerful rares in the last couple of years, and that love has not trickled down to the Peasant level, so we work with what we've got. If you look at the Simic Gold section, it suggests that there's a ramp deck with a plus one plus one counter deck, neither of which are exactly true. Blue-green ramp is certainly a viable archetype, but it's beaten out by red-green ramp by a fairly decent margin. On the other hand, blue doesn't have much support in the plus one plus one counters department as that's mostly centered in Selesnya. We kicked this cube off with more counter synergies in blue, but the drafters almost always ended up in a heavy green-white deck splashing the Simic gold cards, 
which is not exactly where we wanted to be. The problem I'm getting at here is that Simic is the least defined archetype in a cube where synergy and archetypes tend to be pretty tight. In other words, the typical Simic deck is more of a blue-green good stuff deck without a succinct game plan, whereas other decks are laser focused with cards that all complement one another. If you do find yourself going down the Simic path, I find the most effective route is to combine green's efficient beaters with blue's tempo elements. Drop fatties and bounce your opponent's creatures out of the way. You'll take mana dorks here as well, but perhaps at a lesser clip than you would in a gruel deck. For what it's worth, Chris and I would both love to implement a flash-themed deck as blue-green's primary focus, and while blue already has plenty of elements of what we're looking for with that style of deck, green doesn't provide much in the way of potent flash threats. We've got our eyes on a few that are, should be coming to Arena sooner than later, so maybe we can rework the Simic section as the card pool grows and find a clear archetype for the color pair. For now, it's draftable and still fun to play, just a notch below the other archetypes. That's it for this video. I hope this has been insightful to our newer players or even our returning players. And while there are monocolored and mini archetypes that we've discovered in this environment, the two color pairs are the major focus of the cube, so we'll save the micro archetypes for another time. Again, let us know in the comments below if there are any cube related topics you'd like to see a video on, whether that's a peasant or unrestricted cube or just Cuban in general. If you're not already part of our growing cube community, check out the description below this video for links to our Discord and subscribe to this channel for more content like this. Thanks for hanging out. My name is Timothy with Jank Diver Gaming, and I will see you all next time.